On March 1, Rocket Lab unveiled plans for its Neutron rocket, an advanced two-stage launch vehicle tailored for mega-constellation deployment, interplanetary missions, and human space flight. The rocket is expected to be 40 meters tall, with a 4.5 meters diameter fairing. It will use RP-1 as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. Neutron will build on Rocket Lab's proven experience developing the reliable workhorse, the Electron rocket, which is the second most frequently launched U.S. rocket annually since 2019. While Electron provides dedicated access to orbit for small satellites of up to 300 kilograms, Neutron will transform space access for satellite constellations and provide a dependable, high flight rate dedicated launch solution for larger commercial and government payloads. It can carry up to 8,000 kg of payload to low Earth orbit, 2,000 kg to the Moon, and 1,500 kg to Mars and Venus. Neutron launches will take place from Virginia's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, located at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility. By leveraging the existing launch pad and integration infrastructure at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, Rocket Lab eliminates the need to build a new pad. This will accelerate the timeline to the first Neutron launch, expected in 2024. Neutron will also feature a reusable first stage designed to land on an ocean platform, enabling a high launch cadence and decreased launch costs for customers. Rocket Lab solved small launch with Electron, and now we're unlocking a new category with Neutron, said Peter Beck, Rocket Lab founder and CEO. NASA officials said on Monday that the next SpaceX commercial crew mission to the International Space Station remains on schedule. The Crew-2 mission, a flight of SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft, carrying astronauts from NASA, the European Space Agency, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency to the space station, will lift off from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida no earlier than April 20. Aboard the Crew Dragon spacecraft will be U.S. astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, along with Japan's Akihiko Hashide and Europe's Thomas Peskett. The mission will also carry 200 kilograms of pressurized cargo to the space station. The Falcon 9 used to launch the mission uses the same booster as NASA's SpaceX Crew-1 mission, marking the first time a flight-proven booster will be used for a crewed launch. The Crew Dragon capsule for Crew-2 previously flew the Demo-2 mission last year, and workers have spent the last several months refurbishing it for the upcoming flight. Once in orbit, the crew and SpaceX mission control will monitor a series of automatic maneuvers that will guide the crew to the International Space Station. Following a predetermined period in orbit, the Crew Dragon capsule will dock autonomously onto the station. The Crew 2 astronauts will spend approximately six months aboard the station, conducting scientific research in areas such as medical technology, human health, and materials to benefit life on Earth. While the SpaceX teams behind Crew-2 are ready for the April 20 launch, a Boeing uncrewed test flight to the space station is facing further delays. Boeing's Starliner crew capsule targets an April 2 launch, which will test the vehicle after its failed first uncrewed flight in 2019. It's now unlikely that the mission, recently delayed from late March, will be ready to launch in early April. Preparations for the mission are about two weeks behind schedule, in part because of winter weather and associated power outages in the Houston area that delayed software testing for the spacecraft by a week. It's unclear when the mission can take place because of the upcoming Soyuz and Crew-2 missions and then availability on the Eastern Range at Cape Canaveral for the Atlas V launch of the mission. India's Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLVC-51, successfully launched Amazonia-1 and 18 co-passenger satellites on February 28 from Sathish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota. The mission is the first dedicated commercial mission of New Space India Limited, a government of India company under the Department of Space. The 637-kilogram Amazonia-1 is an optical Earth observation satellite of the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. This satellite provides remote sensing data to users for monitoring deforestation in the Amazon region and analysis of diversified agriculture across the Brazilian territory. The satellite carries a wide-view optical imager capable of observing an 850 km range with 64 meters of resolution. It has infrared capabilities that allow it to look at the forest cover regardless of the weather. Amazonia-1 is the first Earth observation satellite completely designed, integrated, tested, and operated by Brazil. 
After a flight of about 17 minutes, the vehicle injected the Amazonia 1 into a sun-synchronous polar orbit. One hour and 38 minutes later, all the 18 co-passenger satellites successfully separated from the rocket's upper stage, in a predetermined sequence. These 18 co-passenger CubeSats include 13 satellites built by the USA and 5 by various Indian universities. India has so far launched 342 foreign satellites from 34 countries, using its Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle platform. The satellite is in good health, and the solar panels have been deployed, said ISRO Chairman K. Shivan shortly after the launch. We have planned 14 missions this year, including seven launch missions, six satellite missions, and the first unmanned mission by the end of this year," he added. The U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory awarded SpaceX an $8.5 million contract to investigate advanced materials and manufacturing techniques for heat shields that protect hypersonic vehicles in flight. Heat protection is a critical technology to shield hypersonic vehicles from the intense heat experienced when flying at more than five times the speed of sound. The contract SpaceX earned is for a project called Multipurpose Thermal Protection Systems for Hypersonics. SpaceX is tasked with researching materials to manufacture technologically advanced heat shields to protect vehicles such as aircraft and defense systems during hypersonic flights. The objective is to refine thermal protection system manufacturing technologies to enable low-cost high-volume production of next-generation thermal protection systems. SpaceX has experience in developing thermal protection systems for its launch vehicles. The company's Dragon spacecraft that launches atop a Falcon 9 rocket features an advanced heat shield to protect astronauts and cargo as they lift off and upon return. SpaceX created the Pika-X heat shield, based on a variant of NASA's phenolic-impregnated carbon ablator material. When Dragon returns, it plunges through Earth's atmosphere, experiencing temperatures as high as 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The Dragon spacecraft's heat shield has worked well and even enabled SpaceX to reuse the capsules with a little refurbishment. The Air Force Research Laboratory is currently researching technologies such as additive manufacturing for hypersonic vehicles. The lab will test these techniques to produce heat protection materials that hypersonic vehicles need to fly in extreme environments like ballistic reentry. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. The 12th SpaceX Starship prototype, serial number 10, was tested for a 10 km high altitude flight at the company's Boca Chica launch site last week. On Wednesday, the first launch attempt got automatically aborted after three Raptor engines fired for a fraction of a second. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk announced that the engines were producing too much thrust, and instead of scrubbing for the day, SpaceX will increase the flight computer's thrust limits and try again. Three hours later, on its second attempt, the three sea-level Raptor engines of SN10 ignited for the second time, lifting the vehicle from Starship launch pad A. Just like its predecessors, SN-10 began climbing to its apogee. During the ascent, one of the engines was seen burning in a slightly different color than the others, indicating that the engine is running fuel-rich, producing an orange flame. The first engine cutoff occurred at T plus 2 minutes and 15 seconds, and the second engine cutoff occurred one minute after that. SN-10 continued climbing to its apogee with one engine active, about 50 seconds later, the active Raptor engine began throttling down, and the vehicle started venting the excess liquid oxygen. The final engine cutoff occurred at 4 minutes and 20 seconds into the flight, and the vehicle flipped to horizontal to begin the belly flop maneuver. The vehicle then spent around 90 seconds in freefall, controlling itself using four large flaps and shedding velocity through aerodynamic drag. At T plus 6 minutes, the three Raptor engines reignited to initiate the landing maneuver. As the vehicle oriented itself to vertical, two of the three Raptors shut down, and the active engine brought the vehicle down for a smooth touchdown. But the landing was not very smooth as it seems to be. The vehicle slightly bounced once, before resting on the landing pad. Let's take a close look at the landing sequences, to see what went wrong during the final hover. As the second engine got shut down, you could see some unusual flames around the engine exhausts and a lot more propellant venting than SN9. This indicates a possible plumbing leak inside the aft section. The flame puff that originated inside the engine skirt moved to the right aft wing, leaving SN10 on fire during the final touchdown. 
Some flames were visible near SN-10's base shortly after landing, until the water deluge system put out the fire. This was not the only problem that SN-10 faced during its landing attempt. A close look at the Lab Padre stream shows us that three out of the six landing legs of SN-10 did not lock into place. Many speculated that the landing leg issue resulted in the bounce we saw during the landing, but according to Elon Musk, the landing was faster than planned, squashing the legs hard. He added that the thrust during touchdown was low for reasons unknown at present, despite being commanded for a high thrust. According to him, SpaceX has never seen Raptor behaving like this before. He added that, next time a minimum of two engines would be active all the way to the ground, and Starship will restart engine 3, if engine 1 or 2 have issues. From this angle, you can see that the legs got crushed completely during the touchdown, and the vehicle is resting on its engine skirt and aft fins. But that wasn't the end of the story. A few minutes after touchdown, the vehicle exploded on the landing pad, rising up and crashing down again in a huge fireball. As you can see, Lab Padre's live stream caught an excellent close-up shot of the explosion. Initially, puffs of smoke came out from multiple locations on the engine skirt. Then the oxygen tank ruptured in an internal explosion, and the vehicle went upwards, releasing the tank's internal pressure. The explosion also sent a shock wave along the length of SN10, twisting and damaging the nose cone. The prime cause of this explosion may have been the flame produced during the landing attempt, which might have damaged some internal components. We will have to wait for the official statement from SpaceX to confirm exactly what resulted in the anomaly. In the end, SpaceX has succeeded in landing the prototype after the previous two attempts, and the data from this test flight will help SpaceX to perfect the upcoming tests. The next day after the flight, workers began removing the debris of the explosion from the landing pad. You can see how the vehicle lost its internal pressure and flattened during the explosion. Hours after the explosion, SpaceX transported its giant crane, dubbed Bluto, from the construction site to the launch site. This crane will lift and lower Starship serial number 11 onto the launch pad once it is rolled out from the build site. The rollout of SN11 could happen as early as Monday. Meanwhile, in a new media blitz, Japanese billionaire Yusaka Mizawa has re-entered the spotlight with Elon Musk to update the public on their Dear Moon initiative. In September 2018, Mizawa's Dear Moon project was founded to return humankind to the moon. The billionaire single-handedly funds the mission, opening up as many as eight seats to take several artists, representing as diverse a collection of disciplines as possible, to the moon. Last week, Mizawa said that the purview of his Dear Moon project has changed in a big way. In a video update, he stated that his initial plan of selecting eight artists was too narrow and arbitrary to properly give as many deserving people as possible a chance at a life-changing experience. Instead of a hand-selected crew of elite or exceptional artists, Mizawa appears to be opening up the eight seats he purchased for guests to just about anyone on Earth. According to him, anyone who considers themselves an artist and are eager to push the envelope of creativity and willing to help their fellow crewmates achieve their own artistic goals can apply for a seat in the mission. Anyone who wishes to participate in the contest must pre-register on the Dear Moon website by giving their name, country of origin, and email address. Everyone who pre-registers will receive an email update about the selection process shortly. Follow the link in the description if you wish to be a part of the Dear Moon project. In the video released by Mizawa, Elon Musk says he is highly confident that Starship will reach orbit many times and be safe enough for human transport by 2023. A recent tweet from Elon Musk suggests that he is eyeing a name change for Boca Chica, the Gulf Coast community where SpaceX is building Starship rockets. Creating the city of Starbase, Texas, Musk tweeted Tuesday. From thence to Mars, and hence the stars, he added. Cameron County Judge, Eddie Trevino Jr., confirmed Musk's interest in incorporating Boca Chica Village into the city of Starbase. According to him, if SpaceX and Elon Musk would like to pursue down this path, they must abide by all state incorporated statutes. Cameron County will process any appropriate petitions in conformity with applicable law. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. The oxygen tank midsection and the aft dome of serial number 15 got mated inside the midbay. 
This completes stacking of the tank section of SN-15, with nose cone and aft fin assemblies remaining. SpaceX completed stacking the methane tank section of booster BN-1. Both methane and oxygen tanks of BN-1 are currently inside the high bay. A recent flyover by RGV Aerial Photography spotted a thrust dome section lying on the construction site. The three exterior holes in the Raptor anchoring points at the middle indicate that this could be a test thrust dome for vacuum-optimized Raptor engines. Watch our previous videos on the playlist to get updates on other Starship prototypes. Link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.